Welcome to our July Navigating Drought webinar. Just a couple housekeeping items before we get started is we'll just introduce our, your, ourselves here. I'm Miranda Meehan, the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist at NDSU Extension, as well as our Disaster Education Coordinator. And here with me in Carrington at the Research Extension Center, I have Zach Carlson. Hi, I'm Zach. I am the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist located on main campus in Fargo. And joining us remotely, we have the rest of our team. Um, and so Adnan, you wanna introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Adnan Akhuz. I am the North Dakota State Climatologist and the Professor of Climatological Practices. I am located here in Fargo at NDSU campus. And Kevin? Good afternoon, I'm Kevin Sadovic. I'm the Extension Rangeland Management Specialist on the main campus in Fargo and the director for Central Grasslands Research Extension Center located near Streeter. Carl? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carl Hoppe. I'm an Extension Livestock Specialist located here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. Lisa? Good afternoon, beautiful people. I'm Lisa Peterson. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist at Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter. And Tim? Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist, uh, Barry Hall, downtown campus of NDSU. That's our team today. Um, and we might have Dr. Jerry, Jerry Sucka joining us in a little bit, hopefully, um, our Extension Veterinarian. So unfortunately, we were hoping we wouldn't have to keep doing these, these meetings with you guys, but um, drought continues to progress in the state and, and expanding in, sever in severity which I know Adnan's gonna talk about, but currently 100% of the state is in drought. This morning, the US Drought Monitor published the, the map on the left-hand side, uh, which is showing the, uh, the areas in drought. All the dark colors of red and, and maroon colors are indicating uh, drought-stricken areas. And as you see, North Dakota is not the only state that has D4 or exceptional drought in the Southwest and the, uh, the Pacific Northwest is still suffering from the long-term drought that had been uh, progressing for longer than two years, especially in, uh, in the Southwestern areas. The map on the right-hand side is showing the, uh, the four-week change. Green colors are indicating uh, improvement. Uh, in North Dakota, you see uh, some improvement did happen to accommodate the past, uh, the precipitations during the past. Uh, four and, and five month period. And the orange colors and the yellow colors are indicating degradation or uh, getting worse uh, conditions. Uh, looking at the past nine month period, starting from October through June, uh, this coincidentally uh, the correspond to the, uh, uh, the water year. Uh, you're looking at your counties and these are the rankings. Uh, number one is showing uh, the driest period on record during the past 126 years. So you're looking at the, uh, the, the driest core areas in long-term period. Map on the right-hand side is showing, however, the temperature. Uh, larger the numbers are the, uh, the warmer the temperatures are, uh, 126 years on record and, and closer to 126 uh, tells you that how warm that uh, the, the county is. Uh, in overall the state, experienced the 10th warmest and the third driest nine month period on record. Um, these two graphics are showing one on the left hand side of the past 30 days of precipitation. Uh, there are some hot spots in this areas, especially in Ward County and Northern McLean County receiving uh, greater than three inches of rain. However, uh, what it means on the right hand side is the, uh, the percent of normal of these precipitation and that, that's the only area received near normal precipitation and rest of the other states did receive uh, uh, much drier conditions and the lesser than normal and three means 3% of normal precipitation fell during uh, that period of time, uh, Southern Foster County and Northern Stutzman County. Uh, when you're increasing your time into 60 day periods, uh, that 30 day uh, the carries uh, into the uh, uh, next 60 day and the 90 day period. And again, the red colors are indicating drought stricken uh, locations. And as a result, uh, in North Dakota, uh, you're looking at the uh, D4 or exceptional drought 
10% uh, of the, uh, the state is uh, covered. Uh, that is 2% increase compared to last week. And you will notice that all, all that increases from last week, 1% increase in D2 or uh, severe drought and 3% increase in D3 or uh, extreme drought. And 100% of the, the state is experiencing some kind of drought and that puts the entire population in drought. So what it means in the historical perspective in one number, uh, that is the drought severity and coverage index. And, and this year, this growing season, uh, the, the DSCI or the drought severity and coverage index reached its highest intensity uh, of 393 on record since 2000. Um, and if I wanted to, to calculate the area underneath the curve, uh, that drought index, and that's gonna give me some kind of an indication of accumulated impact since the drought started right here uh, in 2000. And Western North Dakota has been having some drought trouble uh, since the, uh, the earlier in 2000. And, and the number uh, would be comparable to the previous drought since 2000. And that is the highest number so far since the drought of 2000 to 2006. The reason that I am doing this is to make some comparison uh, between the previous drought in 2006, uh, for example, in 1988, some economic impacts uh, reaching to uh, between five to $10 billion. This is uh, economic impact to uh, North Dakota. However, if I wanted to go back into 1900 to compare the current drought, to give some kind of a perspective of the previous drought, including 1930s, 1970s, and 1980s, uh, this is the nine month standardized precipitation index. Currently we are having negative 2.63. Look at some of these numbers in 1980s, two point, negative 2.72, 1978, 1978. Uh, some of these numbers are very much comparable to the current drought. So it is telling me that in short term, the magnitude of the drought is very much comparable to 1930s, 1950s, 1980s drought. However, if I wanted to go back and be comparable to 1930s that lasted 11 years, 1950s that lasted six years and 19. 1980s, that was a mega drought too. That little sliver on the right-hand side is where we started in the long-term period. So with the accumulated impact, we are still not there, but individual short-term spark, we are very much comparable to 1930s, 50s and 80s drought. Uh, here's the surface uh, soil moisture on the left-hand side and the deep soil to three feet on the right-hand side, all that dark colors are indicating very dry soil. Um, and looking at the 90-day uh, precipitation, standardized precipitation index, all that red colors are indicating severe drought. And looking at the vegetation drought response uh, based on what the satellites see, on the left-hand side is the entire United States. And looking at that drought-stricken states, on the right-hand side, uh, North Dakota only, uh, all that red colors are indicating severe drought based on what the vegetation is responding to that um, precipitation deficit and evaporation. Uh, I am going to skip that and go into the uh, seven day outlook. Uh, map on the left hand side is indicating some green color uh, in August 5th and that precipitation is not much really. It is not a drought buster. Uh, it is between 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 inch of rain. It is not much. Map on the right-hand side is the seven day temperature uh, departure from normal. All these colors are indicating uh, near warmer, near normal to warmer than normal conditions into August 5th. Uh, looking at the second week between August 5 and 11, map on the right-hand side is indicating that it is going to be another dry uh, the week uh, and the temperature wise, it is uh, above normal or warmer than normal conditions. Looking further into the future, uh, week three and four, that's going to take us into the, the rest of August. Uh, on the left hand side, precipitation forecast is indicating drier, and temperature on the right hand side is indicating warmer than normal conditions. 
looking at the entire August, uh, well, that is the picture that we saw before. And looking further into the next three month period from August through October, map on the left hand side is the precipitation. Uh, North Dakota is under a better chance of having drier than normal conditions at the same time, uh, the warmer than normal uh, conditions. Even further into the future, uh, going into November, uh, the same story is going to take place. So uh, the question from the field might come, is there any climatological background that's responsible for this ongoing drought, such as is it climate change or is it El Nino Southern Oscillation? It is really nothing more than a persisting drought itself, creating the drought conditions and persisting into the future. Dry conditions persist and condition become drier in the future because the soil does not have any moisture. Any evaporation from the soil would have added moisture into the atmosphere, which would become precipitation. But since the soil is so dry, uh, it is not really contributing into the, uh, the local uh, moisture source. If I wanted to show you a map of um, upper air, so when you have a warmer conditions and the drier conditions, it creates a bubble of high pressure center that persists very persistently in that central United States, especially in North Dakota, that not only creates that warmer conditions persist, but also it deflects any incoming uh, precipitation pattern elsewhere. So this is really nothing more than persistence of dry conditions creating any drought conditions further into the future, which we call a positive feedback. So that's all I have, and, and let me stop sharing and entertain any question that you may have. Questions, we'll put those in the chat box and we'll, or the Q&A, and we will make sure they get addressed as we move forward through our, our webinar today. So as with water continuing to be an issue in a lot of our grazing systems, uh, even water sources drying up, and we're having water quality issues. Miranda, have, has there been, or you've been working on uh, with extension agents across the state, screening livestock water sources, what are the trends you're seeing? Yeah, so we've screened about a thousand water sources now to date. Um, I haven't looked at all the results. They're continuing to come in um, constantly. Um, our extension agents are very busy with that. But the general trend we've been seeing, obviously, is dry, waters are drying up. Um, and are there, the water levels are decreasing as that happens. The um, total dissolved solid sulfates, that salt and mineral component is becoming more concentrated. So we are seeing an increase in, um, in waters that are crossing that threshold and causing concerns for potential toxicity issues. So um, greater than that 5,000 parts per million in total dissolved solids, um, greater than 1,000 parts per million in sulfates. In addition, we're seeing an increase in cyanobacteria blooms um, and, and as a result, increased re uh, reports of lost livestock. I think um, the last time I checked, about five counties have um, agents within them have, have had some type of report of livestock loss to some type of water quality concern, whether that is blue-green algae or sulfates or total dissolved solids. You mentioned the increase in cyanobacterial blooms. What steps, uh, I see we have Dr. Stucca on here. Dr. Stucca, can you tell us what steps should producers take if they think they're having an active bloom? Yeah, thanks, Zach. You know, your, your options are limited. <laughs> you basically got, a, got one choice and that's to get the cattle out of there. Um, I mean, if you don't have water, I don't care if you got forage out there, you don't have pasture. And so whether it's cyanobacteria and algae blooms or it's high TDS or high sulfates, cattle can't be in there. You can start hauling water. You, if you can find a tank to buy, you can start hauling water. But I always remind people that once you start hauling water, that's a full-time job usually for one person. You have to be prepared to haul water sometimes, many times a day, depending on the size of your tank. So there are no options except to provide better water or get the cattle out of the pasture. I'll just mention a couple things on the cyanobacteria. 
And it's, it's not the algae themselves that kill cattle, it's the toxin that's produced. And there's two different types of toxin that have been identified. And one is a neurotoxin and the other one is what we call a hepatotoxin, which is a liver toxin. Either one though will kill cattle and oftentimes in as little as 24 hours. And it, it's not just cattle, it's actually all mammals that get exposed to that water that it's toxic to. So if I had a, a stock pond, water hole, tank, whatever we wanna call it, let's get that off green color. It's not, it's not necessarily that it's toxic, but that's a sign or a symptom that you need to do something. And whether it's just getting cattle out of the pasture or making sure they can't get in that water or making sure they've got better water to drink, that's what you need to do. It becomes an emergency situation. Uh, and with that, Miranda, what assistance programs are available to producers that are dealing with some of these water quality issues? Yeah, there's a number of assistance programs available. The state has the Livestock Disaster Water Supply Pro Project Program, which is um, administered by the State Water Commission, um, soon to be the Department of um, Water Resources as of Sunday, I believe. Um, and that program, it gives out $5,000 for water improvement projects. Um, that's a stock tank, a pipeline extension, a well, um, and per project, that's a cap per project. And then I think producers can apply for up to three projects. And so that's a really good resource. There's been a really quick turnaround. I think there's been to date 84 projects that have been completed and, and the, the producers have received the money for those projects as well. Other options, um, if you reach out to your local FSA office is ELAP um, and that's the Emergency Livestock um, Assistance Program. And that one provides assistance for water hauling. Um, I know it's not the ideal, ideal, but it is a way to get water to those animals and utilize forage that we may not have been able to utilize because of um, water's drying up or not being of, of good quality. The other one, um, and not everyone is avail is eligible for this, would be ECP program through FSA, which is the Emergency Conservation Program. And I know Ward County was approved. The, the deadline for that, that actually just closed sign up was July 22nd, and I know there's a couple other counties that are in the process of apply, or getting approval for having that program activated within their counties. Um, so just keep a lookout for that, You'll, and it doesn't hurt to ask your local office to see if that's something they're considering. Um, they do provide a little bit more money on those through that one. Um, the other side of it, though, is that with a federal program, you do have to go through some environmental compliance. So it takes a little longer to get those programs in the ground. But if you're looking long term, any type of um, any way we can provide a more permanent, better quality source of water, it's going to increase your drought resistance in the long term. So Kevin, um, kind of shifting from water to forage, um, is there's an, there's an increased risk for overgrazing um, this year, given the reduced forage production on range and pastureland. What steps do you, do you recommend ranchers should be taking to reduce overgrazing? And then following that is gonna be, why is it important for them to minimize overgrazing this year? Sure, I mean, I've, I've driven across much of the state and it's probably the worst that I've seen in my career of overgrazed pastures common throughout the state. Um, past droughts, we'd see areas of the state overgrazed, um, but not other areas. And this year, it seems to be common throughout the state. And what, what's been interesting is you see some areas that have gotten some rain and the pastures are green, but they're still short. Uh, just because the rains have come so late, we don't get enough biomass growing. We just get the green tissue growth, which is still better than nothing. And it's important for producers to understand that overgrazing during this time of the year doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be a long-term detrimental effect, as long as those pastures can get some recovery coming into the fall. Now that's easier said than done because you just run out of grass as we go longer into the season. Um, but if producers can, can, can give some of those pastures that are overgrazed at this time of the year, some recovery in the fall, so they can come into the winter, at least with some growth and some, some rebuilding of the carbohydrates than that root, st root structure, that would definitely be a beneficial uh, to those plant communities. Second, as we get into the fall, we're gonna see, we're still gonna have to graze some pastures short. It's just the way it's gonna be when you have this kind of a severe drought. 
And so I, I, what I've told producers is try to minimize that overgrazing event in the fall to one or two pastures versus all the pastures. It, it provides opportunity for 2022 to allow some recovery for those pastures that were overgrazed in the fall to be deferred from grazing in the spring and even into the summer so those grasses can recover. So plan ahead to, to know if you're gonna be short of pastures and you have to overgraze a pasture, know that that pasture needs time to recover in 2022 uh, and try and give some of those pastures that were grazed hard this spring and summer, some recovery this fall, uh, just to, to minimize that long-term damage. It's important, you know, gr our grasses are very resilient and they can take these type of, of events. It's the back-to-back -back years. And so those pastures that are grazed hard this year, they will need some time to recover in 22. And so plan for that within your strategies and hope we get some rain and that 2022 is a better year so we can minimize that long-term impact on our forages. And following that, Zach, we know the immediate response to, to reduce forage demand on pastures has been to reduce either herd size or decrease the length of that grazing period. Um, you have discussed early weaning as another option to reduce forage demand. Um, once producers have decided to early wean, what steps should be taken to ensure those calves perform well? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when you consider early weaning or have decided to go forward with it, you need to ensure that your facilities uh, will meet the standards of these younger calves. So uh, whether that's bringing in an additional bunk line uh, that might not cater to those 300 pound calves, or uh, it's a water tank and, you, and we talk a lot already about hauling water, but bringing in water until those calves can reach that cup. And so uh, those, first and foremost, it's giving access to both water and feed. And then it becomes what uh, the quality of both of those. So ensuring that you have fresh water, cleaning those tanks to, uh, every two to three days, making sure that water cup is uh, clean and, uh, and accessible for those calves, as well as maybe positioning that water in the beginning when those calves are first brought into those pens, perpendicular or alongside the fence line, that'll allow those calves to discover it. Because not only are you changing uh, the location and separating them from, from the cow, you're also you're putting them in a new place that might contain a, a different type of water source than what you're using on pasture. So be mindful of what water source you're using and how you can help train those calves. The next part then is diet. And uh, for, for a lot of situations, these diets are gonna be uh, uh, fairly expensive if you're going uh, with a total mixed ration or a commercial route. And, and both avenues work well because the most important component is to get these calves consuming feed right away in those first two weeks. And so to do that, you wanna minimize and, and have uniform diet. So particle size, if you're gonna make your own diet, needs to be fairly uniform across. That'll help reduce sorting of those diets. And then you're gonna to wanna to condition the diet because more than likely you're gonna have some drier feed components in there. And so conditioning could be either with your protein source, uh, distiller's grains, uh, a modified distiller's or something wet, or it could be molasses or even uh, water if need be, just to keep the dust down and reduce that dust. So the, if you think about it, the diet you're replacing with milk and, and forage for those calves, those calves gain about two to two and a half pounds a day. So you need to replace that and, and expect that those type of gains with your diet. And therefore you need to manage about a 16 to 18% protein, fairly high protein, at least in that beginning first couple uh, weeks into the first couple months. And then uh, high energy, 70, 75% TDN diet. So that's kind of what you're looking at for a diet and, and it may uh, be expensive in, in the short run, that, that's for sure, uh, but you can slowly move those calves away from maybe some of those commercial feeds or those higher energy feeds uh, into a grower ration, but I would wait to do some of that until you've really got them up on feed at that two and a half percent body weight uh, for intake and really get them going before you, you kind of move towards a growing diet, maybe with a little more forage, a little less energy, but. So those are kind of the considerations on the nutrition side. On the health side, Jerry, um, what steps should producers take when early weaning to reduce stress and help those calves transition into this, this setting? Yeah. <clears throat> so really the biggest thing is trying to remove as much stress as possible. You know, I've seen it in these calves this summer already. They're already under stress, even with their, with their mothers. This temperatures, the dry weather, they want to stand in water if they can find it. 
it's just contributed to calves, calves being stressed already. So be mindful of that. However, when you wean them, it's just like Zach was saying, if they have a palatable diet in front of them, based on what they've been eating, they're more likely to go to feed. You know, and I would recommend that you don't really do anything to those calves except weaning them as non-stressful as you can, whether that's somehow putting them next to the mother. Um, that's not always easy because there's so little forage in our pastures and so little forage that's been planted as cover crop or something else. It's going to be hard to low stress wean right next to them in a, in a grazing situation. But if you can wean them even into confinement and tr try and handle dust at the same time, but wean them where the mothers can come and beller at them for a few days. And the, and the calves more than likely will have an appetite and be hungry and, and be careful not to overfeed them, but they'll go to the bunk and they'll soon lose interest in their moms. Their moms will beller for a few days longer than the calves sometimes when it's like this. But the vaccinations on calves like this, I would just as soon not do anything to them. Hopefully, most of our producers have given spring, some type of spring vaccinations for the control, <clears throat> excuse me, for the control of respiratory disease and, and certainly black leg. If you're going to vaccinate them, I would say wean them first, maybe wait two to three weeks and then Try and come back in there with some booster doses. If you are, if you're in a situation where you have to give vaccines the day you wean them, I would really limit the number of products that you use. Maybe just one dose of a respiratory vaccine, something to take care of internal parasites, and, and that's good enough. Don't put a whole bunch of things into those calves that they don't need at this time in their lives. Just wait until they've weaned and, and are have. Uh, start gaining weight again, then you can put some of those other vaccines. Even something like seven way is not necessary uh, at this time in their life. So it's, it, this is a, a year when everything you do is maybe gonna be enhanced in terms of stress. So just be mindful of it. Be better if you could avoid mixing groups together from different pastures. It's probably, no, no, probably one of the number one things that I see related to calf health is when we mix different pastures together, whereby the calves haven't seen each other all summer long and now we're, we're actually co-mingling cattle together. So if you can avoid that, that helps a lot. If you can actually feed cows and calves together, that helps uh, bringing those pastures together. But with limited forage and uh, limited uh, harvested forage at this point, uh, all of those things are a little more difficult to accomplish. So, yeah, good luck with it. Uh, I think there's, there needs to be a lot of early weaning this year. We're just kind of running out of that forage base that we've got. With that, I'm going to go to Tim now. Uh, currently, all counties in North Dakota are eligible for emergency CRP haying and grazing. What restrictions are in place? And will producers be able to hay before the end of the primary nesting season? Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm not an official USDFSA spokesman, so I'm just gonna generalize and please check with your local FSA office to get the particulars. Adnan mentioned the D2 status on the drought monitor and that of course makes us eligible automatically for emergency haying and grazing. The problem is it has to be outside the primary nesting season, which is the middle of April through August 1st. So uh, haying, emergency haying has not been allowed due to the nesting season and the request for early haying was denied, but really a moot point now because Sunday night at midnight, we're outside the primary nesting season, so very close. Emergency grazing has been allowed uh, at 50% capacity for all season for, for counties eligible for Life, the Livestock Forage Program, and as of now, uh, all but Richland County are eligible for LFP payments. So on uh, August 2nd, early Monday morning, both emergency haying uh, will be allowed for 60 days, one cutting and emergency grazing. It's already been going on. And if you haven't done it yet, it'd be allowed for up to 90 days, no payment reductions, and the hay can be sold. Also, I want to mention that uh, on Monday, non-emergency haying and grazing starts. So uh, part of, uh, LR, part of uh, CRP uh, conservation 
uh, plans may include haying or grazing. And so again, get into your local FSA office and see which one may suit you the best. One other thing that I should mention is for all these USDA programs, including CRP haying and grazing, beginning farmers sometimes, which are uh, farmers less than five years of, of active uh, participation, do qualify for special considerations that I'm not going to get into. So if you're a beginning farmer, take that one. Back to you, Zach. Thanks. Miranda, uh, annual forages are another option for supplemental forage. Uh, many producers are evaluating these for hay and grazing. Uh, is there uh, still time to get something established? And how can they increase their chances of establishment with these? Yeah, so there is still time. We don't, um, it really is going to depend on what use you're looking at. Um, for haying, there, we wouldn't want to put a cool season and we don't want to include brassicas just because of the um, amount of moisture in those brassicas and getting that to dry down. Um, the window is closing quickly. For um, warm seasons, we'd want to have those to get a good, a good growth, enough growth on them. And you'd want something established by the middle of this month, really. Um, after that, there's there's some research by Marisol Birdie that shows like a, a late July versus an early September um, planting date on a lot of these a lot of annual forages, and it's a very dramatic difference. And it, it really, once you get past that point, you're not going to get enough forage to make it worth um, your time, especially for haying, and that's in a normal year. Um, grazing, I, I would still include those cool seasons um, just because. The more diverse of mix we have when we're doing cool seasons, the better chance we have for something establishing. And we've seen that in our research this year is that there's been a lot of variability in establishment, but we've had establishment on a lot of our plots that were in early and we're able to capitalize on available moisture. Um, it's just that some different plants are expressed depending on that timing of of planting. So I, that's one, one really nice thing about having that diverse mix is reducing that risk of establishment. Um, and so those, those would be the big things um, when we think of is just that timing. Um, and then also if you can try to um, pl plant it in conjunction with some moisture. Um, I know we, want, we usually wanna say, wait till you get some moisture, but this year, you know, take the risk. But if you can, you see that there's moisture predicted um, this within the, the week that you're planning on planting, wait till the day before that moisture is expected and get it in there so you can capitalize on that moisture. With that, Kevin, while we're running out of time to establish a fall cover crop, winter annuals are an option for haying or grazing next spring. What species do you recommend for this and how can producers increase their chance for a su successful establishment there? That's a great question. I think annual forages should definitely be looked at this year as an option, um, especially going into this fall dry. Feed's going to be short next spring as well. So the annual forage is something that we can look at. Um, traditionally, we look at winter rye, uh, winter tritted kale, and winter wheat. Um, the, the, the one that seems to be the most successful that almost is almost, you know, a surefire to work is the winter rye. They tend to, to take the drier conditions better, the overwinter better if they haven't germ totally germinated from the, at least above the surface, uh, seem to do better the next spring. Um, so those are the three I would look at. If you're looking for something to graze next spring, your best options would be winter rye and winter treated kale. If you're looking for something that you wanna put up for hay, uh, the winter wheat tends to be the better option for hay quality. Doesn't mean the other two can't be hayed, um, but you, the winter wheat probably not gonna be used as a grazing scenario more of a haying scenario. Traditionally, we put these annual winter cereals in about mid-September, um, and you can cheat on that and start earlier, especially if you have some moisture. I think Miranda's right on, right on, right on, on, top, on what she made the comments on moisture. Um, if you don't have any moisture at the, at the surface, nothing's gonna grow. So, so look at that timing is really critical, especially with the rise. Uh, if you can pick that window and go out a little bit earlier in, in late August, early September, and you got some moisture, don't be afraid to see at that time. Um, it'll give you a better chance of, of success on these winter annuals. So shifting gears, um, given the shortage of forage that producers are facing, Zach, um, we see a lot of people evaluating the use of non-traditional forages. What type of non-traditional forages have producers been considering harvesting as hay this year? 
Yeah, so I think when you are considering harvesting some things that you wouldn't in a normal year given the situation uh, we're in, first and foremost, you need to check and make sure that you're, uh, there's no re time restrictions on your herbicides. If you've applied some of those to these crops, you need to check that and you can do so through the 2021 North Dakota Weed Control Guide, pages 109 through 112 in the back there, list those restrictions for grazing or haying. So make sure you check in with those. But uh, basically, um, there, it's, you know, there's a lot of calls that have been coming in about uh, harvesting cattails, which of course, cattails, if you can get to where they're at, they're going to provide some type of forage, but it, it, it is going to be, of course, low TDN and low protein between five and 6%, uh, even before uh, maturity. And so with a lot of these plants, we're going to talk about quality drives is driven by that maturity. So as we approach August and consider some of these um, flax, maybe is, is one that's been getting a lot of questions as well as canola, you need to consider, you know, what, what you be putting up and make sure to have it uh, for uh, traits as well as, as, as acid for flax. If you're considering harvesting flax there, uh, make sure you get these uh, uh, forages put up and then uh, send some samples out and your county agents can help you get those uh, forages tested, uh, particularly for nitrates and out of these um, crops that you're going to be, you've already applied fertilizer this, this spring, and we know drought uh, increases the concentration of those nitrates. And so be aware of that with some of these, but uh, flax and, and canola have been some. Um, soybeans typically have pretty harsh restrictions on haying and grazing uh, relative to their herbicides use. So uh, be sure you, you make sure uh, before cutting any soybeans that you check those and, and understand as well as making sure you're speaking with your, your uh, insurance adjuster and making sure those crops are still qualifying for the insurance before uh, taking any further steps. But those are some of the recommendations. And I, I think as you look at soybeans or canola or flax or any of these, um, not only check for those poisons, cyanide and, and nitrates, but also get these tested for quality. And it's going to be really important this year to have a plan in terms of what to introduce uh, feeding based on your cow's physiological state. So if those cows are still lactating, you need to be providing uh, adequate protein and energy. And once those calves are weaned, uh, we, we can look at some, some lower uh, quality forages and, and bring those in, but make sure you're coming up with a plan as to when you, you can feed these and, so you're prepared. So Kevin, Zach touched on some of the toxicity concerns. What pr precautions should producers take before feeding or grazing those forages given those concerns? You know, and Zach did cover these really well starting with the nitrates. And the one thing about a drought is drought gives us less forage. And then when it does give us some forage, we have to deal with toxicities. It's like a, it's like a, a, a double whammy for forage production. But as you're putting up some of your forages, especially if you put up your cool season cereals, like an oat or a trade of kale, you need to, need to test these for nitrates, especially if you have some kind of level of, of fertility, especially nitrogen that was put on those crops for grain production, they're gonna accumulate nitrogen in the leaf tissue. So if you got the oats and the, and the barley and the trade of kale, and even some of your warm seasons, I would test them for nit nitrate toxicity. If you're feeding or grazing your brassicas, they tend to accumulate as well, whether it's a turnip or a radish. And so those are ones that if you're gonna graze it, grab a sample, send it in, have it tested ahead of time so you know you're providing a safe feed for them. If you have any of the sorghum sedans or sorghums or, or even straight sedan in your mix, you do want to test them for prussic acid, for cyanide toxicity. Again, if you're putting it up for hay, uh, most producers are going to put it up for hay because they need the feed base. Once you have it up for hay, test it so you know what your levels are, so you can understand the, the options you have in feeding that and, and, and blending those off with other feeds. If you're going to graze them, you know, I tend to, to, to do two things. I'll sort the leaf tissue, test the leaf tissue, because that's what the, the livestock are going to feed on first. Test the stem so you have a feeling for where, what you have in terms of safe feed or not safe feed. And if it's a toxic feed source, just like water, if you don't have water, you don't have cows in those pastures. One thing about forage is if it's toxic to the level where you can't feed it, you don't feed it to livestock because it's going to cause some deaths in your animals and you're going to actually lose more money 
within that, that issue. So test for nitrates, test for prussic acid on those warm season uh, sorghum sedan mixes, and also test your, check your waters. We talk about testing water, but producers need to probably be cautious about going out more often to make sure you're not having any water issues in terms of low water or water not working. With the heat we've had today, we've seen a number of producers lose a number of head of cattle due to lack of water in a pasture because of the issues that we have with the dry conditions. Zach, are there any other special considerations that should be taken when we're utilizing these type of feeds? Yeah, um, you know, particularly some of these may have come with a little bit more of a stem, uh, soybeans or uh, a longer dry down period with flax, possibly or canola. Uh, with consideration towards those, make sure you're providing a long enough period for those forages to wilt. Uh, as we know, putting up wet uh, uh, hay is not only dangerous for spontaneous combustion, but will also create mold and lower that that feeding value of those forages. And, and in pairing with what Kevin said, I think if you have options or can have access to some processing, I would consider grinding, tub grinding some of these forages. It's a great way to blend maybe your higher nitrate feeds in with some low nitrate feeds, as well as some of these that may be a little more stemmy. It's a great way to reduce losses as a as as a way to improve uh, feeding efficiencies this year and reducing the amount of hay loss is uh, that hay is, is particularly valuable this year. Thank you, Zach. Um, Carl, kind of expanding on this topic, what options are there for producers looking for additional hay or feed? Well, that's always a challenge this time of year when there's not much feed available. So the first thing I would encourage them to do is talk to your neighbor, at least you can commiserate on what's not available in the community, or maybe perhaps he does have a cornfield or something that's available and you can reach a deal to create some local feed that you don't have available to yourself on your own ranch or farm. But uh, another option is to go to our uh, NDSU feed list and uh, see if that's available. Go to your county agent and visit with them if you wanna put something on or if you wanna list yourself as needing feed, that type of thing, or you can go to the uh, Department of Eggs, uh, North Dakota Department of Eggs website and look for the hay hotline. And that's another option you can look for feed. Um, of course, we're talking hay in those, uh, that's usually what we refer to. And CRP hay is gonna be opening up in a few days on October 2nd. So we might see a lot of hay being moved, but I warn people on the feed quality available in some of that hay. If it wasn't harvested last year, there's probably a lot of old dead grass in that hay. You'll get a lot of tonnage, but the feed quality is gonna be really low. So now we're gonna to have to look for some type of supplemental feed to go with it. North Dakota produces quite a bit of supplemental feed, um, distillers grains, wheat mids, um, beet pulp, and we have a, an array of uh, protein sources out there too, and canola meal and soybean meal and, and sunflower meal, even flax meal, which is linseed meal. But um, we do have feeds available. You need to contact the producers of these uh, feeds early to see if they are going to be available. So we can have, um, maybe you can enter into a contract and have them available for the next six months, but some of these aren't releasing their contracts yet until we know what our corn crop is. Um, if you are located next to a cornfield, that provides a real opportunity for a major amount of feed if the corn doesn't make it. And based on what things are like out there, uh, we won't know for another three weeks before thing. we kind of get an idea of what's happening there, but there is a lot of forage in certain places like that. So um, if immediately you think you'd harvest it and haul it to home, but one of the other options is to harvest it, lay it out in the field, and put it into a silage pile out in the field, and then uh, haul it next winter. Uh, load at a time into your feed yard or wherever it is. Of course, if you're short on feed, the other option is to haul your cattle to feed and that could be in some part of North Dakota, or it might be out of state. But be sure to figure out what's going on there and have a relationship and visit with them and know if they actually have feed because you want your cows to come home in the same body condition they left, or hopefully better body condition than what they left. But be careful of price. Um, Kevin talked about the double whammy, low production and toxicity. I'd like to talk about the triple whammy, and that's low production, toxicity, and high prices. And the high prices for feed this year are relevant. Um, they're double from last year, and it's a scary situation. And if you need to really consider that issue of selling part of the cows to conserve part of your resources. So after that, 
maybe the next speaker would like to talk about Colin Cattle out of state. Lisa, could you shed some light on uh, what steps producers need to take uh, for uh, before they intend to send any livestock out of state? Good afternoon and thanks for the lead in, Kevin. And um, if I miss something, Dr. Stucka, please jump in. Uh, so if you are considering taking livestock out of state, uh, the things that you first need to do um, is find those places that you want to go or you're considering going. Uh, get what I would consider to be some references from um, the operators. You know, are they good operators? Do they typically have a good reputation? And also get some unsolicited or ungiven references. So find some people that the, the operator that you're thinking about going to um, doesn't give you, uh, you know, and do some good searching. Um, go down and visit those operations. Make sure it's a place that you would like to have your livestock. Um, next, after you've done those things, um, I would contact um, your veterinarian and the North Dakota Board of Animal Health and um, learn about what the um, import requirements are for the state that you are headed to in terms of animal health, and then also what the import requirements are going to be coming back into North Dakota. In every case that I can think of, um, you're going to need a health certificate, a, a certification of veterinary inspection that lists every animal going out of state on it, including um, some type of ID on those animals. Um, and so there may be some other requirements for you know, testing, vaccination, some of those things, depending on where you go. Um, and so you wanna know that before you go, you wanna be on the, the positive side of that. And then you need to also talk to um, your local brand inspector or the North Dakota Stockman's Association chief brand inspector about what the inspection requirements are going into that state and coming back and uh, also have your animals inspected. And then, you know, the final thing that I would do, and maybe it should be somewhere near the beginning, but I would never send my animals out without a contract, a contract between you and who you're feeding them with. And, you know, I really, I am a person, I, I believe a person's word, I believe on a person's handshake, but I get, and I think my colleagues get a fair number of calls every year about people wanting to know what their liabilities are, or what their, um, I guess, um, legal options are for people who have fed cattle, grazed cattle, livestock for them and haven't done a good job. Or on the other side, um, those operators who have done that custom feeding and haven't gotten paid. And so, you know, good contracts make good friends, just like good fences make good neighbors. And so, I would make sure that you have things in writing and both signed um, and so that you have just really some good legal things that go on. And then once you decide that you're going to send those animals out of state, I would take the time to go check on them once in a while. Um, and if you can't do that, at least have somebody in the area able to go check on them and make sure that things are good and, you know, checking in on them. And from personal experience, you know, we lost our whole ranch to fire in 2006 and uh, some wonderful people in North Dakota took our livestock and God bless them for doing that. It was, gave us the opportunity to keep our herd in order. Um, and they took great care of our cattle, but I can tell you from experience, even though those cattle probably came home in better condition than we might've kept them in, nobody will ever keep your livestock the way you do. And so um, give them a little bit of uh, grace in how they manage um, because our, our cattle came home fine. They have fine with, they were very productive, um, but they didn't care for cattle the way we did. And so just know that going into it and, and give some grace to those who may take on your cattle. Did I miss anything, Dr. Stucka? Sounds, sounds good, Lisa, good job. Okay, thank you. I wanted to make sure I covered all the health stuff right. So thank you and good luck producers. You know, Carl said something about commiserating with your neighbors. I do wanna say that all of us are here for our producers if you need somebody to talk to and you're the most valuable entity we have. And um, it wasn't on my topic to talk about, but if you need somebody to talk about, talk to, please talk to somebody. Um, you are more valuable than your livestock and your operation can't continue without you. So, you know, get some help, talk to somebody if you're going through some tough times because we're here for you. 
Tim, on the assistance side for uh, forages and feeds, what are available to producers? Okay, well, to start off, I already mentioned the Livestock Forage Program, and the Livestock Forage Program is administered, again, by the Farm Service Agency and uh, 52 counties in North Dakota, only Richland does not qualify. And so it does get a little bit complicated and depends on the severity of drought. And the, and as Adnan mentioned, the different drought strategies that you're in. And so just a little, I won't get into all the ramifications. Again, you have to see your FSA office. But in the southeast part of North Dakota, where uh, it would be the smallest payment, it's big, big, USDA calls a monthly payments. Uh, and you have to have both acres of pasture land and corresponding cattle numbers and you get paid on the lesser, but the maximum that you could get uh, 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 in four counties in Southeast North Dakota would be uh, 1764 per cow or $4.40 a ewe. And that goes all the way up to, up in North Central North Dakota where you saw in the drought monitor so bad, they, eat, they get the maximum number of payments, five payments. So the maximum that they could expect would be about $88 per cow or $22 for you, as long as they have the corresponding acres to go with that. So if you're in those counties and haven't done so, be sure to check with your FSA office. Uh, next, there are some loan programs and I know that uh, some of you maybe loan programs are not what you're interested in, but particularly beginning farmers that have a high debt load anyway, and and uh, have loans or maybe some of these loans that would uh, help you out particularly on the interest rate. So all 53 counties in North Dakota are U.S. Secretary Disaster Area and qualified again for a USD FSA uh, loans and, and these would be the emergency disaster loans that I'm talking about at reduced interest. And again, beginning farmers there may have some consideration. So if that's at the USDA level. Also recently, just on Monday, our Bank of North Dakota announced two uh, reduced interest rate loan programs uh, directly related to the drought. Uh, and the first you have to apply by June 30th is a livestock drought loan program. This would be more for your out of pocket expenses to either produce or purchase feed that we've already talked about here on this call or transport feed or livestock to feed that had been discussed or even uh, seed costs for forage or cover crops. And so these loans are at three and a half percent interest. The second uh, category of loans is called the Livestock Rebuilder Loan Program. And that's a longer term. So you have till uh, June 30th, 2023, and this would be to purchase or rebuild breeding livestock that you have sold. And so you need to go through your local banker, your local lender, I should say, for both of those uh, programs to try to initiate that. So those are some of the major ones. And back to you, Zach. The North Dakota Stockmen's Association brand inspectors report had a 13.5% increase this year to date. Uh, compared to uh, for livestock receipts and 50% increase in June alone compared back to 2020. Moving into the fall, it is expected that producers will begin to take deeper uh, culls. Lisa, what, can, what strategy should producers uh, use to help them make these more difficult decisions? So, you know, Zach, I think for most operators, they have probably gotten through the cows that are the easy culls. And, you know, those are the cows that are thin, open, uh, maybe old in some cases have bad teeth, uh, bad actors in their herd. And so as you need to, as you go into those deeper culls, one of the first things I would do at this point is I would get on the list for early preg checking with your veterinarian. Um, that is going to be one of the easiest ways to cull those animals out of your herd is that if you have some open cows, those are easy decisions. They should be easy decisions in a wet year, but they are definitely easy decisions in a dry year. So get your preg checking done early. Then go through your bull battery and decide who doesn't need to stick around of your bull battery. You know, if you've got some old bulls, some lame bulls, you know, bulls that have some defects, bulls that haven't performed, whatever the story may be, 
send them down the road. And then um, as you get into the heart of the herd, um, you know, I would really start looking at your records. Uh, look at those cows that are thinner. Um, it's going to take more feed as a whole to, con to uh, get your cows in shape and uh, that are thin. And we know that cows that are in a body condition score five at fall preg check time have a higher pregnancy rate the following year. Uh, we know it takes more feed to feed those cows to keep them in a body condition score five to six at calving time. And so I would uh, really look at those thin cows along with the late breads. And um, those late bred cows, there is probably a decent market for them further south. Um, you know, those folks in, in the Southern Plains, the Southern part of the US tend to calve at a different time than we do. And so your late breads might fit in to a calving season there and you may get a little bit of a premium. So those are some considerations I would look at, uh, but start, start with your records, start with those uh, cows that are uh, open and late bred and then your thin cows. And um, I think that should give you a good start. Lisa mentioned early pregnancy detections. Dr. Stucca, when is the earliest pregnancy test can be done accurately? Yeah, thanks, Zach. You know, with, with ultrasound and there's even some blood pregnancy tests, you can test these cattle for. They're maybe a little bit more expensive, some of the blood pregnancy tests. But our ultrasound folks from our veterinarians that do ultrasound tell me they can go 35 days, sometimes even less than that to find a pregnancy. Uh, really for palpation, I felt comfortable and I think most of our veterinarians feel comfortable at least in beef cattle with 45 days determining a pregnancy. Remember this with a little bit of caution. The earlier you, earlier you detect a pregnancy, uh, the, and the more days there are to lose that pregnancy. And so you can't guarantee that a pregnancy at 30 days or 35 days is going to result in a live calf. So just be aware of that. But it's, as Lisa said, it's a good idea. This would be the season, the time, the year, if you've never done it before, to maybe pull bulls even a little bit earlier. And just uh, save back the ones that got bred really on time and go through. And, and I agree with her on early pregnancy detecting and send some of those cows off down the road that aren't going to carry a calf. Or, or if they're open and, and you've got a, maybe even a grow yard or some yard where they can be fed for a while to put on some weight. Because weight on, on cull cows, uh, not only do they gain weight, which increases dollar, but you, they usually end up increasing price per pound too. So remember those cull cows carry value. If they're real thin, that value is, is certainly diminished. And Dr. Stucco, what type of drought-related animal health concerns are producers currently encountering that we haven't discussed already? Well, I've seen all three this summer. Um, we've even ourselves had a few cases of what I call summer pneumonia or suckling calf pneumonia. And I really believe it's part of it's being brought on by extreme heat and all grouped together standing in water if they can find it and of course that leads to other things as well we've had a we've had more cases of infectious foot rot this year than I think I've seen for some time so those two things have sure shown up I just had a call the other day about pink eye and again it's related not just to lack of fly control but it's also related to cattle grouping up and Whenever the wind blows, and, and, and I would say I appreciate the wind blowing because that provides some relief for this heat. But when, when, it, when for some reason, when it gets hot and you got a little fly pressure, then they want to group up, whether it's standing by a water tank or under the shade, cattle rub nose or grub faces against each other and, and uh, can transmit some of those pink eye organisms. So those, are, those would be the top three. That, that we see during this time and probably more, I don't know about more severe cases, but I would say the prevalence of those diseases, suckling calf pneumonia, foot rod, and pink eye are probably higher this summer. So we've, over the, like the past month or so, we've started to see getting more and more inquiries about regarding the, what the beef inventory is gonna look like in the state following the drought. Tim, can you discuss how previous droughts have impacted the beef herd in North Dakota and, and the US for that matter? Yeah, sure, the, it's very unfortunate of course, but forced uh, liquidation is occurring 
And uh, we've looked at a number of past droughts, and I will start off by saying right now that, you know, it, it's a tough decision, but uh, ranchers are resilient, and Adnan mentioned some previous droughts and did a good job of that, so I'll just kind of mention some of those. The most recent previous drought he mentioned was back in 2017 into 2018. Ironically, beef cow numbers even increased 10,000 that year. Going back to 2012 was a previous drought. Kind of interesting. We increased beef cow numbers 60,000 that year. So uh, droughts that are less, they were less severe. He said that this is one of the worst droughts that we have on record. And so we're, we're not expecting that and we're expecting numbers to go down. We can go back to the 2002 drought then. We started with a cyclically high number of beef cows over a mil, little over a million head. And so we did uh, reduce 2002 into 2003. We did reduce our beef cow herd by three and a half percent. And I guess we're gonna talk more about 1988 in a minute, but back in 1988, we had a uh, cyclical lower number of cows and did reduce numbers by five uh, percent. So I looked at uh, the brand inspecting records for June and it did show 50 percent increase in marketing from all the different you know, auction locals, the way stations and so on. But that 50 percent sounds like a large number of marketings, but it was 35,000 head more than last year. And when we look at the number of cattle we have, on January 1st of this year, we had just shy of 2 million total cattle in North Dakota and beef cows towards a cyclical high of 975,000. So if we go back to uh, 1988, where we reduced 5%, that's the worst reduction that we've had due to drought in, in recent history. It would take us down from 975,000 to 925,000. Again, this is a bad drought, and as Adnan said, and sometimes we have to go back to the 30s or so. So if we reduce the herd 10%, which I think would be uh, possible and certainly depends on uh, when it starts raining. If it starts raining, and Kevin mentioned, and we get some forage and pastures green up, that'll help things by this fall if it stays dry continued liquidation, but a 10% reduction would take us down to 875,000. I know there's been reports that we're going to lose half our cows and or something like that, and there's no precedence uh, for that, but, you know, th this is very severe, and so we're, for sure, we're going, uh, I would predict now that we're going to lose numbers. Back to you, Miranda. Thank you, Tim. And you alluded to this a little bit and touched on it on the beef side, but we've heard several people compare this drought to 1988. Um, but we know it's a different, a little bit of a di different story in terms of economics. Can you dis discuss how it differs um, from that 1988 drought? Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, you know, I remember to 1988 very well. In fact, I remember 1961, I was back on the ranch then and and, and, and that would be a, a very bad drought, particularly up in north central North Dakota as well. But uh, some parts of North Dakota are worse than 1988. And economics really, and I hate to talk theory here and I'll tr try to ease off on that, but there are two branches of study in economics. One is macroeconomics where we look at the bigger picture, which might be the U.S. economy or the North Dakota economy. And then the other part of branch of our study is microeconomics which is more the firm level, or this would be the farmer ranch level. But let's start with the micro level, the farmer ranch level. Really, uh, the economics uh, are not uh, very much different than they were in 1988. It's about the, the same situation. Uh, very difficult decisions have to be made. And, uh, but simply based on we've got so many cattle or sheep or whatever, with some of the things we've talked about here today, what do we have for pasture or feed resources? There's no cookie cutter, uh, nice template that we can go to for you to make decisions. And so uh, uh, I think a combination of uh, many of the strategies we talked to today, rather than one, just doing one, and that would be, you know, uh, 
a combination of downsizing, of early weaning, of finding alternative feeds and making CRP and, on to, and so on to, to get us through. So that's the same thing we did back in, in 1988. We made CRP and we, we did things there as well. Maybe moving more to the macro level of what might be a little bit different is in 1988, we were at a cyclical low kind of in cattle numbers at 874,000. Uh, and now in 2021, beginning, we were at kind of towards the cyclical high, which occurred the year before 2020, back where we had 995,000. We had 975,000 cows, 100,000 more cows than in 1988. Plus the cows probably weigh 200 pounds more than they did in 1988. So we've got a lot of mouths to feed there and, and a lot of requirements. Probably have about the same amount of pasture, except we're for sure utilizing the pasture a lot better now with the range management uh, that we have and, and so on, rotational grazing and, and so on and so. But uh, we've got a, a, a big strain on our resources there because of the number of cattle we have and, and they're heavy. And probably the other thing that's different is we have to handle a lot more money and, uh, and uh, you know, corn in 1988 was $2 and calves were 85 cents and we're over double that on those two. So we just have to have more money. So the t decisions are similar to what they were back then, but are they were difficult then and they're very, very difficult now and uh but th but they have to be made but very very difficult decisions so back to you Moran. as we look towards wrapping up i want to thank you all for joining us today as well as i want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their thoughts please reach out to your local extent ndsu extension agent with any other drought related questions and as Carl said it, talk to your neighbors to commiserate as that's good for mental health. Please join us again August 26th for the next Navigating Drought webinar. Thank you all for joining us and I'm going to just on that mental health, um, be sure to check out our Farm and Ranch Stress page for more resources related to that as well. Mm -hmm.